All right, thank you again. Um, I'm Lisa DeCamp. I'm uh, one of the members of Central Soul. And if you wouldn't mind taking your seats, we will have a break after uh, Mr. Page's talk. Um, but we would like to continue uh, with our session. Um, and uh, this Mr. Page's talk follows in a nice way from Dr. Summers in that he mentioned in the course of his uh, remarks uh, that access is one challenge and then the next challenge come, it comes and that is providing culturally and linguistically competent health care. Um, and as we think about uh, Dr. Summers' remarks, uh, he gave us really the startling statistic that after even after the ACA, one in three Latinos lack health insurance coverage. But the good news is that two in three do, um, but that many of them face uh, cultural and language barriers to high quality and effective care. And so uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. James Page, who will begin to think about the, the challenges that we face in, in the, with uh, this next task. And Mr. Page is the Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer for Johns Hopkins Medicine. He came to us recently from Cincinnati Children's, where he led efforts to shape a culture in healthcare at that institution, focused on delivering extraordinary culturally and linguistically competent care to a diverse immigrant population from over 80 countries. And as he's here at Johns Hopkins, we are excited to continue to partner with him to begin to think about how we may transform our culture of care to provide exceptional care to our Latino neighbors. So with that, I'd like to welcome Mr. Page. Okay, that's great. Can you hear me? Hello, great. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, uh, cultural competency, linguistic care, what it means. I've been at Hopkins for about um, nine months now. I'm new to Baltimore, new to Johns Hopkins. I came to Hopkins, like I said, from Cincinnati Children's. Prior to Cincinnati Children's, I was with DeVita, the dialysis organization. Prior to that, I was with a hospital system in Pennsylvania, and I started off my career with a, a tiny computer company in Texas called Dell. Um, I spent about 12 years at Dell as an engineer. I'm a reformed engineer, so if I start getting fits and start talking in weird numbers, everything's okay. I'm just having a spasm of some sort, and uh, I'll come out of it eventually. So uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about, um, about what I do here and what's important. I don't know how many of you are real familiar with Johns Hopkins, but I was very impressed with Hopkins when I first got here and understand what diversity means for Hopkins. What is it, what, what has our investment been uh, in diversity in the past? And something I'm excited about is that Hopkins is in the DNA, I'm sorry, diversity is in the DNA of Hopkins. We've been doing this for over 120 some years, and it goes all the way back to the founding of our organization with Mr. Johns Hopkins. Mr. Johns Hopkins stated in his, um, in, in the obituary uh, that uh, carried his death, it stated that he despised all forms of sectarianism and bigotry. Sectarianism, for those of you who don't, don't know, is, is just a form of, of hatred arising from a perceived difference, et cetera, et cetera, due to religion, class, um, uh, regional, factional, political movements. So this was in 1870 some that this came out. Now, if you keep looking at Mr. Hopkins' work, you'll see that in his um, last will and testament, he established a home for colored orphans in about 1870. In 1870, he gave $20,000 a year for this orphanage, which is a, um, a great deal of money. Now, if you were to take that 1870 sum and move it forward to 2015, you'll see that we're talking about $5.8 million every year that Mr. Hopkins gave out of his pocket to serve um, kids of color. Now, we, we keep looking forward and we go into other leaders of Hopkins that made this institution possible. And we have to acknowledge that Mr. Hopkins also established that when Johns Hopkins opened the doors of this hospital, he stated in his last will and testament that this would not just be a place for white folks, but also a place for colored people and also children. In fact, the second patient of Johns Hopkins Hospital was an African American. DNA, this diversity stuff is in our DNA. 
keep moving forward, we look at um, Miss Mary Elizabeth Garrett, who gave us the money to open our doors. Now, before she gave the money for Johns Hopkins to open its doors, she said, here's the deal. I'll give you the money, but women have to be admitted on the same term as men. It isn't the question of should we be doing this or can we do this. The bar has been set. So the challenge is how do we live up to this bar that was set over 120 some years ago? The bar is high, and especially if we look at what's happening within our community today, we have an obligation to step up in ways that other parts of our organization, our city, have not. So why am I talking about all this stuff? We have a place of trust within our community. Now, it's an interesting Gallup poll that was uh, put out in um, about 2011. They asked, who do you trust the mo most? And, and when you look at this, it's kind of interesting when you look at who has the most trust. When you look at the first few um, um, uh, 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 roles there, what do you see? Nursing. Nursing. There you go. In, in fact, nursing, are, are, you, are you a nurse, I assume? Okay, listen, uh, I'm a, yes, give her a round of applause. I'm going to put this out here right now. I'll stay behind this counter about as long as I can. So cameraman, I've been told not to move. We're going to see if I can do that or not, because this is difficult for me. Okay, so um, now, now nurses are at the top, but then what do we see? We see other people in healthcare, right? We see pharmacists, we see doctors. So those are the first folks, and it makes sense. Now, we keep going through, and what do we see after that? Education. We see teachers followed by, and I I'm, I'm really want to talk with Gallup about this. And, and it, it's a different time, different place. But even when we put this together, I wanted to understand how and why and who were the people that were surveyed. But law enforcement is after that. We keep looking, and what's next? Religious folks. Now, these go with what I call the trust centers in our community. The trust centers are those parts of the community that carry more weight than the place that have the money. So if you look at Hopkins, Hopkins is a trusted organization. But honestly, the people that really have the trust in our community are the frontline uh, care providers, the health care providers, the schools, the barbershops, UV salons. So as we start to think about how we develop a more culturally competent education um, center for Hopkins, this need to leverage our trust centers is important. Now we keep going to the folks at the bottom. What do we see? People are trying to sell you stuff, right? People want your money. Uh, uh, car sales, we all trust car sales people, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, right below them are what? Our wonderful politicians, right? <laughs> they sit at the bottom of this. And it makes sense. So we have a unique um, uh, position within the community that we are a trusted center. People don't know what they're walking into when they walk into our environment, but it is important that we realize the trust that's invested in us as organizations. Now, let's keep going through this. When we start to talk about diversity, there is usually a, um, a diversity wheel. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but the diversity wheel has a couple of different aspects to it. First are the internal dimensions, those things that we are born with. Now, we move, keep moving outward, and we go from our internal dimension to those um, external dimensions, which are our um, things we acquire over time. Finally, we go to the outside, and we start to look at things that are our organizational dimensions, our station in life. Now, this is how it's normally shown. I don't like necessarily to think about this as, a, as wheels, but if we start to think about these as icebergs, I, I think we get a different kind of picture, but unfortunately, it's not on here. So we're going to pretend <laughs> that I put that slide up here, right? Basically, if we start to think about these things as icebergs, there are certain things that you can see clearly, certain things you can figure out, and certain things that are well below the um, surface. Now, you look at me, what do you think? And, and I know you're going to say he looks like Denzel Washington. He is so amazing, well-dressed. Everyone must be wanting some of his time. I know that's what you're going to say, but outside of that, what do you see when you look at me? <laughs> well, a man, a man. Someone said a man. Uh, I've, yes, that's, that's pretty safe. Mature. I'd be... 
Some are about to make me curse. Uh, do we have a beeping uh, thing on there if I slip up? No, no, okay, I won't say the word then, I was thinking. Okay, mature. Um, what else? New ideas. New ideas, that's great. That's, that's probably one of those things that are below the iceberg, right? What else do you see? Well-dressed. Yeah. Well-dressed, thank you very much. I owe you some money, yes. <laughs> African-American, black. Diversity and friendly. Diversity and friendly, so you're assuming that I'm friendly and diverse, yes. <laughs> Approachable, you're assuming I'm approachable as well. So you're seeing the side of James that's very approachable, friendly. Now it's interesting you said um, African American, because usually that's the thing people won't say. They'll, they'll, you know, he's so well dressed, he's well spoken, he knows how to tap dance, his hair is curly, he's got a little bit of gray in it, blah, 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 but they usually don't go towards the obvious thing, which is black. Now, if you keep looking, you'll see, okay, he's got a wedding ring on, so that means that he's probably married. Now, um, I also wear a, wear a um, crucifix everywhere I go, which you would figure what? Christian, Re Christian yes, some sort of uh, religious. Now, all those things are things you can kind of figure out. Now, if we keep going really, really low, I've earned every gray head in my hair, and it's because I have three kiddos. Now, I love them to death, but they make me earn every gray hair I have on top of my head. Now, why do I say that? That is not something you can easily figure out, right? Who in here is a uh, mom, mom, dad? So, we got a lot, okay. Anyone in here, grandparents? Okay, we got a few, anyone in here, great grandparents? Okay, no great grandparents. But if you were to look at, uh, who said grandparent over here? You did, what's your name? Gloria. Gloria, Gloria, can you stand up for me, Gloria? Okay, it's, look, look, it's still, turn around, do, do a spin for me, Gloria. <laughs> look at that, okay, okay, go ahead and sit down. Give Gloria a round of applause. Here's the question I want to ask you. When you think of a grandma, when you think of a granny, is Gloria what comes in your mind? I mean, do you look at Gloria and say, you know you look like somebody's grandma? <laughs> you, you don't. You have to ask that question. Yes, ma'am. All right. And not only that, she's got a college student and a proud grandma, too. So, um, so you have to ask questions. Now, if you were to ask any of these folks in here who are parents or grandparents, what's more important? My status as an employee or a person who's attending a conference or whatever it is, or my status as a parent? What are people going to say? Parent. parent. Assuming your kids didn't drive you crazy that day, you're going to say parent, right? But which of the two is it easier to figure out? That you're a man, woman, that you go to Hopkins, you went to a conference, or that you're a parent? Which is easier? The, the, well, it's easier to figure out, not parent, but the, what, assuming you don't look real ragged and have a lot of gray hair like me, we're going to say the easier thing to figure out are those things that are above the surface layer, layer of the iceberg. And to get to those things that are below the surface layer of the iceberg, we have to engage and ask questions. That right there is the key about being successful within diversity, engaging and asking questions. So we'll keep going through this. Uh, what, so what is diversity? Okay, this is a wireless mic, right? I, I can move, uh, yeah. So what is diversity? A inclusion, okay, what else? Differences. Differences, what else? What? Variety, Variety. great, great. Okay, so if that's diversity, my question is, what is inclusion? Boy, this thing is just jumping. What is inclusion? Making sure everyone counts. What did you say? Acceptance. Acceptance. What else? Acknowledgement. Acknowledgement. Bringing others in. OK, OK. So are they the same? No, no absolutely not. Um, I, I like for people, to, when they think about diversity and inclusion, I like for people to think that Diversity is being asked to the dance, and inclusion is being asked to dance, right? Diversity is being asked to, the, uh, asked to the dance, and inclusion is being asked to dance. And we have to make sure that as we start to think about diversity and inclusion, it's not enough to have butts in the seat, but we have to understand, are we engaging people fully in our conversations and desires? Up there is that dang on iceberg. <laughs> so, 
okay, I'm going to have to, um, we pretend you all are just seeing this for the first time. Okay, y'all got it? Yeah. Conversation has been had, we're moving forward. Okay, so at Cincinnati Children's, there were four pillars of diversity that we focused on. And we're trying, I'm still trying to develop those pillars here at uh, Johns Hopkins. The first pillar is, um, is safety. The second one is workforce, world-class experience, followed by world-class healthcare. Each of these are critical elements of diversity and inclusion in a successful program. Now, we start to think about safety. It's the ability to be able to competently communicate, understand the differences, understanding those items that engage and disengage people in their healthcare process. We look at um, experience as creating that ideal patient, family, employee experience that lives up to their diverse needs and expectations. We keep moving on to what does it mean when we say workforce. We're talking about recruiting, retaining, and developing and promoting a workforce that reflects our patient population. And finally, we look at world-class healthcare, and it means a top-rated institution is serving an increasingly diverse and international patients and families. Now, we're going to keep moving on. The one I'd like to focus on is um, uh, um, safety. Now, safety is important because it, I think that's the easiest one to talk about, and my slides are out of order again, but we're going to pretend that, they're, um, that I meant to go to this slide right here. Um, but as we start to think about uh, diversity and inclusion, we also have to understand what does it mean locally? What does diversity and inclusion mean within a specific neighborhood, a specific community, a specific country, uh, within language groups, things of that nature? Now, as we start to think about this, um, I, I, I'm, I'm a huge sports person. I'm a huge sports fan. I, I grew up in Indiana, so, so I'm an Indianapolis Colts uh, person. But, um, but we're going <laughs> to, well, people are packing their stuff, getting ready to leave. I'll pretend that I like your team as well, the Ravens, as much as the Colts. But here's the deal. The, the Ravens are in the Super Bowl, OK? And they're receiving, first kickoff. Ball is kicked off, boom. Your man gets it. He's way back in the end zone, way back. He gets the ball. What's the best thing that could happen? Depends on how much air is in the ball. I got to give you some for that. <laughs> um, OK. Um, the best thing that could happen is a home uh, is a, a touchdown, right? 110 uh, yard touchdown. Okay, the Ravens are uh, the Baltimore Orioles. Ball playing ball, bases loaded, bottom of the ninth. You're down by three. Ball comes across. What's the best thing that could happen? Home, run. home grand slam, home run, right? Okay, um, Mr. James Page is up at the tee. He's looking pretty good up there. Oh, we're playing golf. It's a par five, but he's good. He grabs his pitching wedge, even though it's a par five. He lines up, he pulls back, he hits the ball. What's the best thing that could happen? Hole in one, absolutely. Take a look at this, and I'd be dang on if it didn't play. In America, if you hit a hole in one, you're expected to buy everyone a drink. However, in Japan, it's traditional to buy your playing partners expensive gifts. <laughs> Yeah, same hole. At HSBC, we never underestimate the importance of local knowledge. <laughs> HSBC, the world's local bank understand the rules that's happening around us. We understand what's happening with our community, our local place, but diversity is very local. Diversity is unique for that particular group, patients, individuals you're serving, especially when we're talking about healthcare, where so much of how we take care of each other is very local. Now let's um, uh, talk about um, um, perceptions. 
What, what do you see when you look at this uh, slide here? A cube, right? Does everyone see a cube? Yeah. Right. Now, absolutely, you see a cube in here, but the, it's really not a cube up there. What you see are eight circles. And these eight circles align themselves in such a way that our mind automatically fills in the gap and creates a cube, even though a cube is really not there. Now, this happens all the time, especially when we're talking about within healthcare environments. We see an individual, and we see a, a, a mom who's in the waiting room with a child, and the mom is wearing um, sweatpants and, and um, a sweatshirt, and the child, one child, she's got one child kind of um, locked underneath this arm, and the other child is swinging on the, uh, the computer cow thing, and the third child is just standing in the middle of the room and just spinning around in circles, and we're starting to paint a picture about this mom, right? We walk in the room next door and we see another child and the mom is sitting there and she's got a, a huge diamond ring on her finger and she's got a, a big mink coat on even though it's July in Baltimore. Um, and the child who is five years old is sitting in the corner with her legs crossed studiously reading War and Peace. Um, we're painting another picture about that family and that child. Now we don't know the details of it but our mind fills in the gap, even though, even as I'm talking through these things. What we have to do is make sure that as our mind fills in the gap, that we're not jumping to stereotypes. And we're using this information to engage in conversations so that we can have intelligent dialogue about what it is this individual wants, what's happening within their life, and how we can do our job the most effectively. So as we keep going through this, I put up a word here. What do you, um, what, what do you think of when, when, um, when this word is up? Uh, okay, I, I have the phone. The sport. The sport, okay, the phone, sport, what else? <coughs> what? Bugs. bugs, okay, phone, sport, bugs. Crass, Cr crass. Cr the, the little cricket machine that cuts, um, cuts paper. Who knew that in here? So just me and you. <laughs> ah, I'm pretty good, right? Y'all didn't know how much I knew. A uh, cricket machine that cuts uh, paper. Uh, what else? OK, so, so if I were to say uh, cricket and, you, and talk about North America, usually people are talking about that kind of cricket, right? Now, if we go to Europe and I say cricket, people are talking about the sport, right? Now, if I were to go to Southeast Asia and talk about cricket, we're talking about food. Yeah, food, right? Um, I assume all of you knew about this, right? And, and why, why are uh, you just, some people are just squirming. It, it's a reality. But why is this a reality? Why do some people use crickets as food in parts of the world? High protein, absolutely. Uh, grow, having cows and chickens and things of that nature all over the world, it's impractical. It's, it's not a good use of resources. And in many parts of the world, protein comes from things like crickets. It's a reality for those parts of the world. Again, we have to understand that, lo that knowledge is local. We keep going through this. And here I have a picture of what? A glass, right? Now, if I were to say glass in the United States, what are we talking about? A drinking item, absolutely. So if I were to say a glass in Vatican City, a cup in Vatican City, what, are we, what may I be talking about? What could I be talking about? Yeah, um, a, a communion, a, a sacramental chalice. Now, if I were to say um, Malaysia and say glass, what might I be talking about? What is it used for? If I were to say a medical instrument, cupping. Who's heard of cupping? Yeah, absolutely, right? And, and anyone feel comfortable describing what cupping is for those that don't know? Yes? Yes. Yes, you take a heated cup. And you put a heated cup on um, someone's body, and it sucks the uh, skin up, kind of creates hickey. It gets the blood moving. And afterwards, people have these um, uh, kind of large hickeys on their back. 
Now, we, we keep going forward, and these, this is an accepted uh, medical practice that's been around for um, thousands of years. Um, we keep moving forward, and we, um, uh, same thing, uh, coins. In the United States, we think money. In China, um, and, um, uh, decorations possibly. But we go to Cambodia, and it's very common for it to be a healing device. The other side of cupping is coining, which is another healing technique where they take a coin and you rub a coin vigorously across the body and it creates um, welts. Um, it kind of looks like um, this. Now this right here is an actual picture of an employee from Cincinnati Children's Hospital that got this technique done. She flew from Cincinnati to China and the first thing she did when she got to China was to go get um, coin because uh, she wanted, uh, it makes her feel better. Now, it also, with a child, you'll see um, uh, something that looks like this, where there are just patterns across the body. Now, you're looking at something like this in a, in a healthcare setting, you may think, what? Abuse. Abuse, right? So we have to stop, ask questions, make sure we're engaging our folks so that we don't jump to assumptions. Because let's say that we separate that mom and child, you know, five minutes. Okay, listen. Um, I, I, we're going, Mom, we're going to separate your, you from your child for five minutes so we can, okay, maybe five minutes is too long. Uh, we'll, we'll do one minute. One, Mom, you stand outside one minute. We're going to talk to this child one minute so we can, uh, okay, 30 seconds is all we need. 30 <laughs> seconds of, Mom, stand outside. We're going to talk to this child for 30 seconds. That's not that long. That's really not going to harm trust that much, is it? Probably so. Absolutely. If, you, if you're accusing this mom who's been doing something that her grandmother and her grandmother's grandmother's grandmother has been doing, and we say all of a sudden that's abuse, we have to be very careful about how we engage these things. I'm not saying we don't ask questions, we don't figure out what's really going on, but we have to understand the uh, cultural uh, aspects of what's happening. How much time do I have? About hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, 15. Okay, I'm going to try to get through this. So Pepsi did a, uh, a great commercial in the uh, 80s, 70s, somewhere around there. Someone said, I'm, did you say I'm old school or just old earlier? <laughs> I, I'm going to let it go. Mature, that's what it was. Uh, so they did this great commercial. It, it had a lot of success. It was called uh, Come Alive with Pepsi. And they ran it all over the globe. Now, it was a fantastic success. They ran it in. Um, um, uh, Latin America, they ran it in Europe, they ran it in China, they ran it in the United States, everywhere. But we have to ask ourselves, when it went to China, it was perceived a little bit differently when this campaign went to China. What, how did it translate? Now, we're gonna, <laughs> we're, I'm gonna ask you to do a showing by hands. Um, a is, it's the best, it's best to drink Pepsi if you want to stay alive. That's a pretty good campaign slogan, right? <laughs> Translated um, to B, meaning life is meaningless. Drink Pepsi. <laughs> you know, pretty good. Um, C, Pepsi will bring your ancestors back from the dead. <laughs> now, one of these is the right answer of how this campaign translated in China. Who thinks it's A? <laughs> Just, you got to work with me a little bit now. <laughs> who thinks it's B? OK, we got a few Bs. And who thinks it's C? <laughs> You're absolutely right. Um, it translated to <laughs> resurrection. <laughs> I mean, Pepsi was flying off the shelf, and they were just going right to the uh, cemetery and just pouring it all over the graves and seeing, OK, they didn't do that. But the fact is, is that we can't underestimate the power of local knowledge, translation, and things of that nature, right? So we keep thinking about, um, about these um, nuances and how we communicate. And, um, okay, who in here speaks Spanish? Okay, well, I'll be dang on. Okay, y'all can't answer the question, okay? <laughs> y'all aren't going to tilt this crowd. The rest of us are going to act like we know, we don't know what any of this means. So, what is this word up here? Embarazada. 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 <laughs> I speak C++, Fortran, COBOL, and Pascal. Those are the languages I speak as an engineer, okay? So, what does this mean? 
to those of you who don't speak Spanish, what's this seem like it means? Embarrassed, Embarrassed right? Now, for those of you who do speak Spanish of some sort, what might it mean? Pregnant, right? <laughs> so being embarrassed is not the same thing as being pregnant. <laughs> we keep going through here, and the next word is, <laughs> what, what's the word? Constipado. Uh, OK, so the time has changed, y'all. So now we're a little bit short, but I'm still work with it. Constipado. And, and for those of you who don't speak Spanish, it could mean constipated, right? Now, those of you who might understand what this word is, what does the word really mean? It's not the same as have, having a cold, right? Different areas, you're right, different areas. Yes. Um, malas, malasado? Malas, malasado? OK. Um, for those of you who, what might this word mean? Molested, right? Now, for those of you who do speak various forms of Spanish, what could it mean? Bothered, absolutely. So being bothered is not the same as being molested. We have to have people who speak the language, understand the language, and um, uh, know how to work. Now, earlier I told you all that I spent about um, 12 years in Texas. And it was great because the, the language there, you know, in Austin, it, at times it's not quite English and it's not quite Spanish, but it is Spanglish, Spanglish right? We had a Texas, a Texas style of Spanglish that we spoke in Texas. Now, once per day, put up a finger up. That's how many times I'm talking about. Right, one time a day. You give someone a prescription, we're talking about one time a day. Unless they're speaking Spanglish, and how many times a day am I talking about? 11. 11 times a day, not once per day. We have to be very careful about the impact of who we're talking about, how we're talking about, and how we're engaging folks. Um, intoxicado, final word, which could mean intoxicated, drunk. Um, but there is a story about a gentleman. His name is uh, William R Ramirez. Mr. Ramirez was an 18-year-old able-bodied athlete before he collapsed. When he awoke, he was a quadriplegic. 36 hours were spent in Florida emergency rooms treating him from a drug overdose before doctors realized he had a subdural hematoma and other brain injuries. They took the word intoxicado to mean drunk when the family meant that he was ill due to something he ate. They did not have a proper in, um, interpreter in the room. So what happened? Mr. Ramirez is now quadriplegic. The hospital lost a $71 million lawsuit. The impact of doing this work well, making sure that we understand not just what's being said, but what's being meant is paramount. It is critical. It is a safety issue. It is an important as understanding that someone has drug allergies. We have to make sure we're pushing the bounds and holding our organizations to do the right thing. Um, I'm not going to get through the rest of my slides, but we're going to end on a fun note, I guess. So um, we're going to, um, uh, there's a sentence up here. We're going to try to do this quick because I have how much time? I have two minutes. <laughs> Okay, what's this uh, sentence up here? Um, sir, what's your name? Rafael. Can I get a mic? Raphael. Raphael, here's the reason I chose you. I, I, you're, you're not very, um, you seem very reserved, so I want to give you opportunity to uh, talk into the microphone. Um, if I can talk. Test, test, there we go. Um, can you read that sentence for me? I didn't say she stole a book. Wonderful, now what does that sentence mean? Um, you're not blaming this person? Yeah, you're not blaming this person. They didn't take the book, right? Anyone disagree? Pretty easy sentence um, for you educators. What level of sentence, uh, what grade uh, sentence is this? Second, third level, first <laughs> grade sentence? Pretty easy, right? Now, here's, as, as we start to think about um, micro communications, um, we get different meanings of sentences. Now, I, I, I want to uh, have this sentence read again. What's your name, sir? Archie, how are you doing, Archie? Good. Can you hold the mic for me, Archie? Archie, I want you to read this sentence as well. And I chose you for a reason, Archie. 
Can you stand up for me? Go, go ahead. I won't bite. Ah, you know it. Yeah, I know. You were both mature, as they say. Um, so, so here's the deal, Archie. I chose you because you look like a, um, a, a desbian in the making. You look like an actor, a Brad Pitt wannabe. <laughs> so, I'm mature. Like <laughs> so hold the mic up, Archie. So I want you to read this sentence, but what I want you to do, Archie, is I want you to make this first word really pop for me, okay? You got it? I want this first word to really sing, okay? Okay, go ahead, do it, Archie. I didn't say she stole a book. Give Archie a round of applause. Thank you very much. So, so Archie is saying, I didn't say she stole a book. What is, it? something's happening there. I, he is being defensive, right? Now, what's that? Defensive, defensive absolutely. Now, we're going to do this real quick. You get the second word up here for me. You, Archie said a high bar. Stand up. What's your name? Paige. Paige. Uh, I love that name. It kind of sounds like my name, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> So you get the second sentence on here. Make it pop for me. I didn't say she stole Wonderful. Thank you very much, Paige. Round of applause. Paige is saying, I didn't say she stole a book. What's happening there? I didn't say it. What is she? She's being a little bit defensive, right? Now, you get the next word because you look so eager to talk. What's your name? Stephanie. OK, Stephanie, you get the next word up here for me. I didn't say she Come stole on, a Stephanie, book. Come on, Stephanie. You had two big bars set for you. Stand up, get your diaphragm moving, get it working. I didn't say she stole a book. Thank you very much. Give Stephanie a round of applause. She's saying, I didn't say she stole a book. What is she saying? I didn't say she stole a book. She applied it. She wrote it. She emailed it. She texted it. She Twittered it, it, but she didn't say it. So I didn't say she stole a book. What am I saying? Somebody else said, I didn't say she stole a book. What am I saying? She brought it, right? I didn't, say she, I didn't say she stole a book. What am I saying? The whole damn library, right? I didn't say she stole a book. What am I saying? Yeah, she stole your ex-wife, your car, your dog, all that country music stuff is rolling, but you don't have the book. So again, these micro-communications are absolutely critical to understand. We have to understand not just what our patients, our people, our employees are saying, but we have to understand what they mean, and that's the hard part. Um, stole a book. OK, we're going to pretend that this um, next slide simply says, um, thank you very much for your time. I had a wonderful time. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I, have, I have 15 minutes for questions, so a few minutes. I have a few minutes for questions. Um, if you have any for me, again, I'm building the program here at Hopkins. It's slow. We've had a lot of things occurring, so it's not moving as quickly, but we're going to have an amazing, fun, relevant program when I get down. What questions, comments, concerns do you have for me? You did a wonderful job of explaining the diversity and the inclusion. But how do you work into that the economic disadvantages and differences of, of folks in, in your, in your four-legged model? I, I think the economic differences are, a, um, are, are just another aspect of that iceberg. Um, I didn't talk about it, um, but it is an important element of the iceberg. I think what's happening right now within our community, within Baltimore, there's a huge economic um, diversity that's not being recognized or understood. So that's probably the, uh, the area that I'm spending the most um, energy on right now is trying to figure out how do we address that. Um, it, it is the solution is going to be different. It's not <laughs> simply about understanding what people are saying, but it's also understanding their lifestyle, how they got to that point. When we looked at Cincinnati Children's, we put programs into place where um, we were focused not just on the fact that someone had asthma, but our folks went out and realized, okay, the asthma was not controlled. Why? The asthma wasn't controlled because this person had a, I mean, this is a true story, a hole in the roof. And the child was living with a hole in the roof, and the parent couldn't afford the medication, the landlord wouldn't fix it. So all these things add up, and they are an important part of diversity and inclusion. We also, I'm also a really huge fan of, um, we created a model called um, culturally competent de-escalation. And understanding that where people are from and their network, their education, all of that influences how they escalate. So if we think about a, um, 
uh, again, a, a mom who is um, a dad who um, wants her child seen in a, an emergency room. They come in, they're carrying their sick child, and they think that there's something deadly wrong with their child. The, um, the, the, um, the, per the nurse behind the desk, the person checking them in, looks and says, okay, it's not as serious as you think, so grab a seat and we'll be with you in a second. Um, that parent is going to do anything and everything they can to make sure that child is seen immediately. Now, now what does that look like when we talk about escalating? Uh, you've got someone, I'll get you in a second, you've got someone who, is a, uh, who plays golf, and they play golf all the time with um, Paul Roth. Paul Rothman and this person are golf buddies. How are they going to escalate? I'm going to call, I'm going to listen, get my child seen, I'm going to pick up the phone, I've got him on my speed dial, I'm going to call Paul Rothman, and you're going to lose your job if you don't get on this. The goal is to get their child seen, and they're leveraging the best tool they have available. You get someone Again, generalization, so you have to work with me on this. But you'll get someone from the neighborhood around the corner from here who doesn't have that network, maybe doesn't have that education, things of that nature that that person that happens to play golf with Paul Rothman all the time has. How might they um, escalate? Yes, sir. They go off. Curse you out, maybe. Curse you out. They'll spit something, maybe. Flip something, maybe. They're going to threaten you. I'm going to blow this blah, blah, blah up, right? It's like, okay, so I forgot my uh, detonator. And, but, okay, but they're going to, again, the, same, the goal is the same thing. They want their child who they feel is in deadly danger seen. Now, this actually happened to me in my previous organization where we had this situation. A child came in with sickle cell crisis, and it, she was a 16-year-old, and it was unlike anything the mom had seen previously. The, um, the uh, person behind the desk was asking, what's the weight? When's the last time she ate? All these questions. And mom is saying, I don't care. Take care of my child. Mom escalated in the way that you said. She went off. The person behind the counter wasn't used to that. Now, if you're from that neighborhood and someone does that, in, say you're grandma or grandma, you sit down and shut up. Um, I, you, but if you're not used to that and you see that kind of action, what happens? You get nervous. You get scared and you start to escalate with that person, if not go into a defensive mode. So you've got two people escalating at the same time. Now you've got this person that's behind the desk escalating. What is she going to do next? Call security, right? Now, that, that's great, because security makes everything better and everything calms down, right? <laughs> Absolutely not. What happened when security got to that mom? She got worse. Security said, oh, no, she is really angry now. So what's security do? Call the police, who happened to be outside for another reason. So police come in now. Now, that helps things a whole lot, right? So mom is really calm, right? No. Mom is completely livid. Now, all the time, her daughter, 16-year-old daughter, is being in the back trying to be treated in a deadly sickle cell crisis. And she wants to know, is my child being taken care of? What's happening up front? Or the police are having a conversation about whether or not we need to detain this mom and put her in the back of a police car. The child dies. The child dies. The 16-year-old daughter dies. Think about the impact it would have had on that mom if she was sitting in the back of that police car while her 16-year-old was dying. That is an economic diversity that comes into play. So what do we have to do? We have to make sure our staff understand the power of economics and they understand the power of culturally competent de-escalation and how to apply those tools and skills in our organization, because there's not another organization in America where trust, the ability to not know what's going on around you. Hell, we don't even know what it's going to cost us when we come into this place. There's not another organization like that in our country. So we have a tremendous responsibility to make sure that we're being responsible. I'm sorry, I went on a tangent. There was another question, or am I out of time? Yeah.
is this time. Thank you. A very engaging conversation. And you, were touched, you just touched upon something that I'm interested in exploring. With much of what's happening in Baltimore City and many of the discussions happening within Johns Hopkins focused on race and, and poverty, will the Latino health and that, di that type of diversity and the poverty that's experienced in Baltimore City be lost in the conversation? I, I, don't, I don't believe so. No, it will not. Um, the, the fact is, is that um, health and the lack of health care is a paramount reason that we ended up in this situation. It, 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 yes, it was job, about jobs, it was about poverty and youth, but health care and the lack of health care is a huge portion of it. I think that as I'm having these conversations, I'm absolutely making sure that um, we are being aware and we're trying to pull members of the Latino community to the table as I'm meeting with um, community members. Um, unfortunately, media has created a storyline about what happened within our home, within our community. I mean, if you look at the media, you look at Fox News or NBC or anywhere else, you'd think that the whole city was burning down. I mean, from Fells Point to, um, to DC to, you know, wherever. I mean, if it had Baltimore associated with it, it was on fire. I, I was telling my daughter, the, uh, she was so concerned because my family, my wife and kids were still in Cincinnati, and they'd call me up, Dad, are you okay? I was like, yeah, I'm fine. I mean, I'm driving into work, and the only difference I saw was the fact that streets were clear and I got to work earlier, easier. I mean, I saw nothing at all. Now, unfortunately, the media has twisted this thing, and it's become solely a angry black thug media, uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, conversation is happening. And we know what's really happening. And unfortunately, the plight of the African American community is very similar, if not identical, to the plight of the Latino community. But we have to make sure, as a whole, that as we're having these conversations, that we're considering both communities and understanding that, um, yeah, I think that's a great. One. And we're also understanding that as one ship rises, so does the other. We cannot uh, tackle this issue and expect one group to benefit without the um, other group being part of the conversation, part of the solution, and also benefiting. So um, we are absolutely making sure we're pulling it in and making um, both um, parties aware. Am I out of time? That's perfectly fine. Okay. They don't, know, they don't need to rest. They don't need to rest. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm just going to go off the slide where you were talking about lost in translation. Uh, I am originally from Boston. And, you know, you were talking about it as it being something that we see it as something internationally, but I see it as well something right in our homes. Um, I'm Dominican American, I'm first generation, and when I talk to my mom, I go into my Spanglish, and she's like, girl, if you don't talk to me correctly, I don't understand <laughs> what you're saying. So. Um, seeing it from a perspective of um, being born and raised in the U.S. and having parents that are either learning the language or becoming familiar with it, it's um, something that hits home as well as something that you could see it, again, internationally, like um, with soda and pop. That's something that's right at our doorstep, and I'm like, uh, I call it soda, and even with sprinkles and jimmies, it's just how you had constipado on um, your screen. And some people, it's just like with the dialect or what area they're from. Like the Caribbean, what's constipado? We don't know. It's engripado or gripe rather than what you had on screen. So it was just more of a comment that we see it in different levels, but in all of society. I completely agree with you. We have to understand that healthcare communication, it is very local. Um, again, I was born in Louisville, and um, I love talking to my uh, uh, family members from Louisville who calls a, call a, a, a doll a dowel, uh, your hair, your hair, and um, your car, your car. 
Um, you know, just it, it's very local. But getting more specifically, healthcare is very local. So I re my son has asthma. He has pretty severe asthma. In fact, I left my job in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, outside of Philly, because my son has such severe asthma. And I was talking to my um, wife's grandmother, my ch son's great grandmother, about my son's asthma, and she said, "Baby, I'm gonna tell you how to take care of that asthma." Okay, Grandma, tell me about the asthma. And grandma says, go find a tree. Now, not a big, huge tree, not a little bitty tree, but you know, just a nice-sized tree. And line that baby up to the tree. And go get a nice, sharp knife. And put a mark right above that baby's head, and that'll cure his asthma. I was like, okay, Grandma, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> now, you know, and I kind of let it go until my wife and I decided we're going to go to in, uh, Indianapolis and have date night. And, you know, we want the kids to play with Grandma and things of that nature and come back from date night. And there's Grandma with the knife and <laughs> putting the mark in uh, Barty's head. And we're like, okay, at least she didn't slip and cut off his head. <laughs> we're happy about that. Now, here's the interesting thing. Grandma's right. Now, what Grandma said is by the time he outgrows that mark, his asthma is going to be gone. And Grandma's right. Now, why is Grandma right? Tree grows, kid grows. Tree grows, kid grows. Kid eventually outgrows the mark. And what? Act grows the asthma. I mean, right now, my son, he doesn't use his inhaler that much at all. And forget the, what y'all may think happened. I'm saying grandma did it. Forget <laughs> everything else. Grandma cured my son's asthma to a great deal. Now, that happens all over the place within our country. If we start to think about um, a, a common cold, right? Now, now, from a Hopkins perspective, we say, how do you deal with a common cold? Let it. Rest, fluids, let it go away on its own. Oh, Grandma Thorpe and Grandma Pullen, they had some things for you about how to take care of a cold. What did they say? Gargle what? Gargle salt water. That's a good start. What else did Grandma say? Chicken soup. What else did Grandma say? What's that? Mustard rub. That's a good one. Someone else said, what is it? Hot toddy. Hot toddy, right? Cola, 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 syrup, syrup, whiskey, and rum. I've heard, I've heard yeah, your family and my family, I mean, they, I, I got a coat. <laughs> Give me that whiskey and rum. Um, I have professional drinkers in my family. They just had colds all the time. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Don't take a shower. Can't, don't shave. I mean, that's a great one. I mean, you just, you people, and you're not going to pass on the code either, either if you don't take a shower and um, not shave it. Um, what else is there? I've heard rolling an egg on your chest. What was yours? Wrap a silk scarf. You know, silk has special elements. It works like that. Um, Another one I heard was blowing smoke, cigarette smoke, in a baby's face. <laughs> and, and these are doctors that are telling me that their patients are doing it. What other um, ones do you hear? Vicks Vapor Rub. So here's all these things that are happening. All, all these are cures that our grandparents, great grandparents, great great grandparents say that work. And we're saying, from a scientific perspective, we're not too sure about it. Here's another quick example, and then I'll get to a question over here. My son, again, the one with asthma, he's a, he's a boy. He's 100% he's boy. So we, were, we lived on a big hill in Texas, and he had one of those Tonka tank trucks. Tonka trucks, the big yellow ones with the big wheels, and he decided he was going to skateboard that right down the hill. So he got on it. He skateboarded down the hill. What happened? He fell, skinned his knee. He comes running back up, carrying the 
truck behind him because he wasn't going to let that go. I'm in the garage doing spring cleaning. He ignores me, goes right past me to mom. Mom does the mommy doctor thing. She pulls out the foamy stuff and the Band-Aids and all that and the creams and puts on it, puts on him, tells him, okay, you're okay. And he looked at it. Like, uh-uh. That's not it. We need something else before this treatment is over. What else did he need? Kiss on the boo-boo. Now, he needed that as a critical element of his healing technique. Now, we could say at Hopkins, listen, boy, that is not evidence-based medicine, <laughs> and it's not going to do you any good, so go back out there. To him, I'd almost say that was more critical than the, band, the Superman Band-Aid that he had on there. Now, we could try to tell people that all these things are nonsense, they make no scientific ev uh, sense, but the fact is, is that they are part of our culture, they're part of who we are. There's a question over here. We have time for one more question. I have a question. I'm not sure if the mic is on, but I have a question um, as far as um, many Latino families using their children as um, interpreters. And how are the clinics, and I know some of them are not adequately staffed with you know, bilingual um, associates, how are they combating this trend? Because it could be lost in translation. Uh, uh, absolutely, it. absolutely. And there's a lot of examples um, of how that went wrong. There's an example where the, um, the kid who was translating for his mom didn't want to tell her that she had um, cancer. And so he decided to tell her that everything was going to be OK. Um, there are lots of examples just like that. Um, I can speak more confidently about Cincinnati Children's because I had linguistic services as part of my team there. I'm working with the team here to help us build our program, but um, I am just starting to get into that. At Cincinnati Children's, it, it, it was a very clear violation to use family members as interpreters, period. Um, now, we were able to enforce certain rules because of the, um, it was a pediatric clinic. We did not allow, if the staff member wanted to have an interpreter and the staff member was not in, comfortable with the interpreter, they could um, also insist for another interpreter if, um, if the family decided they didn't want to have one or what, for whatever reason. Um, we used um, qualified bilingual staff, so we had staff that were interpreters that were qualified, that they were on, in their daytime, maybe they were a technician, they went through a test, they got certified, and they were able to work at a, as, a, um, as an interpreter based on the qualification level. They got trained for that. We also had a very robust staff. We had uh, telephone interpreting, and we also had video interpreting that was done via um, both large machines and iPads. We, everyone that had an iPad, we loaded the video interpreting uh, software on there. So we really tried to use technology, but we established a very firm rule that you could not use children or family members as interpreters, and our staff were empowered to say, I am not comfortable with this interpreter, and they can insist on another. And they could also insist on the same thing if someone thought they spoke English well enough, but the staff were not comfortable with it. I'm not too sure exactly how that works here at, uh, at Hopkins, but uh, we'll get to that point eventually if I have anything to do with it. Okay, thank you very much. This has been fun.